As we come together this morning, I invite you, if you would, join with me first in our breakthrough prayer as we come together for worship. Come, Holy Spirit, come show us how we can be the spiritual heart of this community. Amen. And if you'll join me in prayer. O oh God of creation, you have blessed us with the changing of the seasons. As we embrace those autumn, these autumn months, may the earlier setting of the sun remind us to take time to rest. May the crunch of the leaves beneath our feet remind us of the brevity of this earthly life. May the steam of your breath in the cool air remind us that it is you who gives us your breath of life. May the scurrying of the squirrels and the migration of the birds remind us that you call us to follow your will. We praise you for your goodness forever and ever. And if all of you sweet children will come forward and have their story. Before they get all their Good morning. I got some responses. So I see we have a few costumes, but I think we all need to dress up. So we have some choices here. We'll come back here and see what you want. Oh, nice. Okay. So, you want me to check on it? Oh, you're smart. Okay. All right. So, we're all in disguise, aren't we? We like to pretend we're things. So, Isabel is pretending she's Wonder Woman with a kitty cat on. And I'm sorry, Lana, I don't know your costume. What's your costume? A vampire. Okay. So today is a day of pretending. We pretend we are things. So what are you? What are you going to be for Halloween tonight? Uh, a ninja. Okay. Mac. Okay. All right. Hey, what are you going to do? A ninja. You're Wonder Woman. Owen. Dinosaur. Oh, all good costumes. Yeah, they're just made to look, I guess it's supposed to be scary, I'm not sure. Uh, so our story today is it about... Like <laughs> it's about pretenders, people who are pretending. And they were actually the leaders of the church were pretending. They were pretending to be very good and follow all the laws and do what they were supposed to do. And Jesus said, no, you all are putting on costumes and having big ceremonies. But inside, you're not following God. It doesn't matter what we put on the outside if the inside is all nasty and not what it should be. So it doesn't matter what we look like on the outside. And most days we don't look like this, do we? No. It's fun to look like this a few times a year, but every day we don't. But it is important every other day of the year that we put on. You can take that off. You don't have to wear it on. That we show on the outside what is in, on the inside, and we want that to be good. We want it to be a loving person, a caring person. What can you do to, on the outside that shows what I know is on your inside? What about helping people? Yeah. Caring for people, saying nice things. I know you all have good hearts. You have Jesus in your heart, but let's show it on our outside, too even when we don't have to wear costumes. Okay, so let's say a prayer. Can you say a prayer? <laughs> Repeat after me, dear Lord. Dear Lord. Help us to show on the outside the love that's in our hearts. <clears throat> Amen. As we uh, come into our time of offering this morning, this is our time we get to share our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Um, but I do invite you as a music place to lift up your prayers, to make your offerings in the plates that are up here. But let us take this time and give all that we are to God. Thank <laughs> you. 
us pray. Most gracious Lord, we gather and we come to you today in this time of offering as we lift up who we are. We lift up to you our prayers, our presence here, our gifts that we have given, our service, and our witness. Lord, we come in this day as a time when we are looking to see you at work and see the things that you are doing, to see the long story that you have been telling from the very beginning, that you have been helping us to grow and to become more than what we once were, that you have been helping us to find that new place and to use who we are and to grow closer to you, and that you are still, in fact, at work through all that is taking place. So in that, in that place today, we lift up our joys that we celebrate we lift up to you good reports that we have received of folks that are healing and recovering and getting well and, and folks that are on the mend. We lift up to you our joys and celebrations for the good hard work of our youth and our community that have been doing such a great job and, and the opportunity that they have had to, uh, to compete against others, to build their skills and to grow into the people that you have made them to be. Lord, we give you thanks. We lift up to you also in this day the opportunity to serve our community in fun ways, as we are looking to this evening, and in other ways that are, that are important, that reach out and help and care for those who are around us. Lord, we give you thanks. But we also lift up our worries and our concerns. The many that we have lifted up who have passed in this last, in this last week, in this last time, and that are hurting, and their families who are grieving and mourning their loss. We lift up to others who are still working on healing and recovering, who are trying to figure out what is going on and trying to get well and to work through all of that. Lord, we commend them into your care. In still places close to home and far away where folks are just struggling, where times are hard, where they are in situations that, uh, that, are, that are tough to decide, to understand, to know what to do, Lord, we commend them into your care. And still those many other places that just need to hear your voice, to know that you are present, to help them to find stability and grounding and a sure foundation to build a life on it. Lord, we commit them into your care. And through all these things, Lord, we ask that we hear your voice. That as we hear your voice, we know you call on us to go out and to share your good news through our actions and through our words, that, who, that through who we are, others may come to see you. That we can be strength, that we can be help, that we can provide wisdom, that even maybe we can just be someone who can walk with folks for a time and, Lord, help us to share who you are, who we know you to be with all those we come across. All this, Lord, we lift up into your care, and we do so through the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we commit all of this to you through the words that he taught us those many years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our scripture reading is for worship today is from Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and 3, 1 through 7. If you are able, please stand as we read our God's word. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord commanded the human, eat your fill from all of the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. The snake was the most intelligent of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the snake, We may eat the fruit of the garden's trees, but not the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, Don't eat from it and don't touch it, or you will die. The snake said to the woman, You won't die. God knows that on the day you eat from it, you will see clearly and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was beautiful, with delicious food, and that the tree would provide wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then they both saw clearly and knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made garments for themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Today is, uh, I think quite literally because it actually is Halloween day, it is the start of an unofficial season. It is the heaviest season of the year. Uh, today starts unofficially, of course, food season. <laughs> when all the food comes, all the stuff hits, it, uh, because today it's candy, um, and tomorrow is, if you go to Walmart, Dollar General, or Dollar Tree, it's half price candy day. Um, so you can get all that stuff, or if you don't need that, you can even, uh, uh, if you've got kids who are trick-or-treating, you know the parent tax, right? That's the one where it's either so much of their candy, or it is your favorite pieces of their candy that come out there. Um, and I am very proud to say that at the Pinkston house right now, the parent tax is at a full 100%. <laughs> Not because he hasn't gotten any, but he was at, uh, at a different daycare on uh, Thursday and Friday of this week because uh, for some reason our, uh, our babysitter decided she wanted to go see her daughter play softball in Springfield. I don't know why, but she decided she wanted to do that. And so he came home on Friday with his own little bag of candy. Which for someone who is currently eating lots of baby food and a few things he can kind of crunch up and uh, get really soft on his own, but he still struggles with Cheerios a little bit, having a Snickers bar is not a great idea. So, 100% parent tax, it works out well. Um, and, even, and Emily even gets some of that too. Uh, now, so we are, this is the heaviest season. So we start, we've got candy today, and I give it about a week before we start seeing turkey stuffing and cranberry everything, right? Every fast food uh, restaurant, every place is going to have their own version of that. Like, part of me wonders how McDonald's has, as, has as of yet, not to come out with a uh, turkey and stuffing McRib, right? <laughs> like, I don't know if that is a good idea or not, but I'm surprised they don't have it because that's what comes. All of the all of that stuff comes up through this time of year, and and I can hear the pumpkin spice people in the background going, "We've been having stuff since the first part of September. Where? Why don't we start back then?" I'm like. Because that's all liquid. That's just coffee. That doesn't count as food. That's just pre-season to everything that's coming up. I mean, we are into it now because we get to Thanksgiving and we have all the turkey. We've got about three days in there to finish all of the leftovers before we hit Christmas cookies, Christmas cakes, Christmas candy, Christmas parties, and all of that stuff begins to come in. And all of this season goes on until January 5th. Why January 5th? That's the day everybody, all the kids go back to school. And that is the collective time when we look at that and we say, what in the world did we just do for the last two months, right? I mean, that could just be me that does that, but I don't think it is. Like, it, it is, we are in this food season. So in honor of food season, I thought, we're going to do a series and we're going to look at different foods in the Bible. Like, hey, why not? That sounds like we can do that. And, and each week we're going to have uh, a little something uh, uh, that I'm going to share with you all. And currently, if you've been wondering what's up there on the altar... Um, those are little treats for after worship today that uh, that you can have some of. Um, if they're good, I made them. If they're not good, Jack made them. So, um, sorry, but I'm already blaming things on you. But uh, but we're going to do that. We're going to have different treats after after each week. Originally, I thought I was actually going to cook in the middle of worship, but um, then I read between the logistics and the time needed to be able to do that, even if I prepped really well, I'm like. Probably not going to be able to do that on Sunday morning. So I'm just going to make some stuff instead, and we're going to talk about uh, about those different foods. And uh, that's going to that's that season of the series is going to come to an end on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, when we're going to do two things. One, we're going to decorate the church for Advent because you know we need to we need to do that, and we're going to have a very un-Thanksgiving celebration for lunch that day after church. Um, and by that, we're going to do something we haven't done for a while. Uh, we're going to do a big birthday dinner. Um, uh, we haven't done that for a while. It'd be fun to do, and we're, uh, I'm going to put one rule on there. No turkey or dressing for that meal. Anything else is good, but no turkey or dressing. We're just going to have some fun. We're going to celebrate a meal together, and uh, we're going to get ready for uh, the season of Advent that is coming. Um, but all of that is to say, this morning we're starting with the very first food in the Bible, uh, which is what? What's the first food we have in the Bible? Apple. Yep. You know, good, tasty apple that we've got uh, there in the Bible. And uh, so but that's the first food. And what, uh, what weren't Adam and Eve supposed to do with that apple? Eat it. Right. Yeah, they weren't supposed to eat the apple. The only command that they had been given was don't eat the apple. Uh, 
you know, of course we know what they do and all the trouble that then comes after that. And something I should say at this point is we don't know if it was really an apple in the garden. All that we're told is that it was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a friend of mine is very fond of saying, it may not have been an apple, it could have been the kumquat of evil, for all that we know. Um, that, uh, I, you know, the whole story takes on a different meaning when you put it into that kind of terms. But, uh, but for, our, for us, an apple works. I mean, it's something that, there is a story about how in the Western tradition that we end up an apple being the fruit that we use for, we use for that tree. I don't remember exactly what it is, but I do know that apples just are very common all over the place. And so it works really well for us. It works really well for me because I like apples. In fact, we have an apple drawer in our refrigerator. It's the very bottom drawer in the refrigerator, and it always has a, ba a bag of apples in there. Sometimes it has overflow from the veggie drawer on top of it, but most of the time it's just apples that are in there. And that is like my go-to snack to have at, uh, at night, especially. And uh, so that's, you know, and uh, so we have that, and so it works well for me. But there's lots of things you can do with apples. Even just in our house here, but we've got apples, we've got uh, apple sauce, apple butter. Um, we have the food dehydrator, so we have little tasty apple chips that uh, uh, that make great snacks and make great gifts. And and uh, those are just a few of the things you can do. Oh, and uh, in making uh, my treats for today, I had some leftover stuff, so I have a uh, I have a very creepy uh, a very creepy Halloween apple pie for you. Um, <laughs> that is currently sitting at home. The crust looked awful on it, so I'm like, um, we're gonna have some fun with how we're gonna put the, the, the slits in there. So, um, and it works well for Halloween, maybe not quite for Thanksgiving. Uh, but there's all sorts of fun things that you can do with apples. The question then becomes, how do all of those uses, how does that all work with the presentation we have of that fruit of the apple in the book of Genesis? Um, the apple is a symbol for the fruit from the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, from here we're going to start kind of getting into the weeds just a little bit. But there's some things that we need to remember as we do this. And uh, you'll have heard me preach from, uh, from, from this passage before. Uh, the first few chapters of Genesis especially I think are very important and so I come back to them on a fairly regular basis. And so some of the things first to remember is first that we are created in God's image. And then the second thing to remember is what is that common refrain we have from the first from the story of the seven days of creation that comes back over and over? What's that refrain that comes back? What's that? And it was good. Exactly. We have always and it was good. So we're created in God's image, and all of God's creation is good. Those are really important things to remember. But in doing this, God does something radical. Like, if we had been in charge of uh, making all of creation, we probably would have done things differently. Um, one, it probably wouldn't be as good. We'd have a whole lot more stick figures out there if I'd been in charge of things, because I can't draw worth anything. Um, but uh, uh, we also would have probably done away with this whole free will thing, because that just is an added complication that just makes things hard, right? Uh, but God said, no, you know what? I'm going to create them. They're going to be in my image. It's going to be good, and I'm going to give them the ability to make a choice. And so he says, uh, you know, you've got this one thing. Don't eat from uh, this tree. Now, the trouble is that at some point we were going to make the wrong choice. It was never a question of if. It was always a matter of when that, that was going to happen. Traditionally, we say that this is the fall. The first sin that is committed, uh, we say, is, is the fall. And it's when sin enters the world that... Really, it had been a possibility from uh, the beginning. But here's the thing. Until sin comes into the world, comes into the picture, this apple is only ever going to be an apple. It is good. In the garden, it is just as God intended it to be. Um, but it is only ever going to be an apple. Without... Uh, without that ability to do something different, we're never going to have applesauce, apple butter, apple chips, a creepy looking apple pie that uh, we're going to bite into uh, at home later today. Um, none of that ever comes about. Now, let me make the, uh, a point again here. There is nothing wrong with the apple just as it is. In the garden, it is good and it is fine just as it is because it is being created by God. 
Um, but to become more, though, means that something has to change. To become more than just this apple means that uh, destruction is going to happen. An apple can't become any more than it is until you start to do this. Until you start to peel it. Until you start to do something else. Until you start to, uh, until you start to chop it up, mix it up with things, uh, put it into a pie. It never becomes anything else. Now, you know what happens when you begin to do those things? Have you ever done this thing where uh, you go and you might be a little bit distracted when you're trying to make a pie and you've got to get a cup and a half of sugar out and instead of grabbing the sugar, you grab the salt? And you go and you put that in there and you get it all mixed up really good and you take that first bite of that pie after that. That's about the nastiest thing in the world, isn't it? But that's what part of what happens. When all of a sudden we can start taking that apple and doing different things with it, we're going to have times when it's just going to be flat out awful and the worst thing that we probably have ever tasted in our lives. There's also going to be times when you can do everything exactly right. You can make the best crust in the world, not that one. That one was bad. Um, you can make the best crust in the world. You can make the best filling. You can put it in there. You can get it in. You can bake it until it is looks really good and it doesn't have this bad egg wash that I did on there and you can get that in there it's going to look perfect and wonderful and you go and you take that first bite of it and you know what you do you just kind of go meh it's okay and sometimes it's just not going to be very good I mean it might be okay but it's not going to be it's not going to be that uh, that pie you remember it's not going to be one of George's pies over there where you're like oh I want that one it's not going to be that coconut cream pie that now I'm going to make myself hungry. Um, but uh, sometimes that's just what happens. It's just, it's just sort of okay. It's not great. But after some time, and after some practice, and after some work, all of a sudden you start to make those pies that just taste amazing. The ones where you take that bite of and you're like, this is what I'm going to judge every apple pie going forward from here uh, based on, right? The ones that when you, when you think of having that, you begin to drool just a little bit. Um, it wasn't with apple pie, but a couple weeks ago we went up to, uh, we, uh, well actually, we've been a couple different places where this has happened recently. We get our, our apples for uh, making all of this stuff, uh, often from Waverly, from Peter's Market over that direction. And uh, just a couple weeks ago we went to Uptown Farms to the Pumpkin Patch. And in both places we had this experience of just when you drive up and you begin to walk into the building, this smell hits you of freshly fried apple cider donuts. Those things are amazing and they're <laughs> wonderful and I love them and uh, we had to get some uh, because we couldn't help ourselves. Uh, but you know those are good. You know that someone really knows uh, what they're doing. But that only comes with all the mistakes, with all the attempts, and with all the failures to get to that point. Um, so let's put all these things together. To make the obvious comparison here, uh, we fall into the same sort of place. We are created by God, and we are created good. In the garden, we live a good and a complete life. Um, that is just how it is. I mean, we are in the garden. It's good. It's complete. We are fine uh, right where we are. But there is a reason why God gave us the command that he did. Remember, there were two trees in the garden that get named. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and what's the other tree that gets named in there? You don't have, remember what that one is? What's that? Tree of life. Yes, the, other, the second tree is the tree of life that gets named in there. And, uh, uh, and God does what any good parent does. This is the thing that we're beginning to figure out, is that when you know your kid is going to do something wrong... Don't you, try, you kind of try to funnel them into something where, one, they aren't going to hurt themselves, where it's safe maybe, where they can learn something or do something. So, you know, we, we look at Jack when he was crawling around, like, oh, dude, Jack, Jack, no, don't go lick the refrigerator. Like, the, dude, that's gross. Or, uh, no, don't go play with that cord that might be plugged into something. That's his favorite thing to do. Straps and cords are like his two favorite toys. Um, we, you know, there's all sorts of other things that we say. We try to direct him away from that. Because you know what happens how many sermons have you ever heard preached on the tree of life? It got really quiet in here when I said that. 
Right? We never do that. Why? Because God was really good at that misdirection. Because when God did that, when he said, don't eat from, don't eat from this tree, you know what immediately they focused on and forgot everything else about? They focused on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What other tree that's over there? Um, they were focused in that direction. But God knew, because that's how he made us, that we were going to break at some point, that we were going to sin, that things were going to be broken. And so he gives us that choice, leads us into a direction that, uh, that we can go. Um, because he knows that when we do that, we're going to grow. We're going to become more than we were. When we do that, we may, you know, we may have to go through that bit of destruction first before we can become something more than we are, than we were before. But God doesn't leave us in that process. Remember that all of Scripture is a story, is a, the long arc of Scripture is a story of redemption, where God is always working on bringing us back, helping us to find that place again where we can be whole and we complete, we can be complete, and he gives us grace to do that. Now, we aren't ever going to be the same again, because you can't unpeel an apple, right? That's really hard to do. But we can be made new into something different. We can be made whole and complete in a new way into something different, and it can be good. It can be more complex, more uh, more complicated than it, than it was before, but God gives us the grace we need to find that place. We can't go back, but we can become something new and find a new wholeness and completeness there. In Genesis 3, we're told uh, that we are kicked out of the garden so that we don't eat from the tree of life. So we, don't, so we don't live forever. So we don't have eternal life in all of this. And it's seen as a punishment, but you stop and think about that for a second. If you are walking around the garden literally with God, what good does a tree of life do you? Like you're already in paradise. It is already the best place that you can be. What good does that really do you? We're already in the best place that you can be. And yet we leave the garden because we've been broken some way in there. We're finding our way back into what this new thing is going to be. But God is still there with us. And he shows us the path to eternal life. That God doesn't ever hold anything back from us. But he sets us up to receive it when we can handle what it is that we've been given. That movement towards being able to handle eternal life comes as it does after we've been broken, after we've been made whole and complete again, and then we start that journey. Uh, theologically, we call that sanctification. In Methodist terms, we call, we call that going on towards perfection. And that's going to be something we're going to come back to uh, uh, as, we come, as we go through these next few weeks. But for now, the things to remember are that uh, it was never a matter of if, but a matter of when things were going to get broken when we were going to sin. But uh, God gives us the ability to still be made whole after that. It can be very different than we ever were before, but that's okay. And the process then of being made whole and complete and being made into that new thing, he's going to set us on the path to eternal life. As we go out into a world that needs to know that message that in so many ways is broken and in so many ways has folks that are more than happy to say just how wrong everything is and how broken everything is, be able to know and to say that there is still hope beyond that because that's just what God does. That's a powerful message that we can share. So let's go, let's be those people that share that message, that know that things are going to be broken, but God can make them whole again. Let us go and let us do that in the name of the one that God sent into the world to show us in a way we had never seen before how we get to eternal life. Let us go and let's be those people in Christ's name. Thank you.